there was all kinds of new weapons that were used in World War I that had not been used previously in, in other wars. Uh, the ones I probably want to focus on, we talked about airplanes and, and bombs being dropped from airplanes. Uh, we also talked about machine guns. But I think one of the most devastating weapons that was incorporated in World War I, really for the first time in a large scale, was gas and chemical warfare. And I put up this visual here that said the most effective weapons maim rather than kill your enemy. And, and the picture shows us exactly why. If you kill an enemy, ah, the body is just dead. You're gonna, you'll take care of the body later. But if you injure somebody, look at how many people it takes out of the fight to go care for that person. So some of these weapons really were designed uh, just very brutally to injure or to maim somebody. So that would take more soldiers out of the fight to care for that person uh, that was hurt. Now, gas warfare itself, I'll, I'll kind of lump these together when I say gas and chemical warfare. Gas warfare was uh, before World War I. It had been around before that, but this was the first war that it was used, and it was used by both sides. Now, the French used tear gas, which is non-lethal, but it does burn your eyes, and it, it's very, very uncomfortable. It doesn't kill you, but, but it's very uncomfortable, and, and the idea the Police today even still use this on large groups of people if there's a riot or something. Now, Germany was the first one to use chlorine gas. Now, chlorine gas will maim you, uh, maim you, it will burn you, it will kill you. And we're also going to talk about mustard gas as well, too. Now, chlorine and mustard gas, terrible, terrible gases, and those were, those were used by both sides. Um, now, chlorine gas, it does not poison the victim. It actually suffocates the victim, and it's a terrible, painful way to die. Uh, inside your uh, your lungs and inside your mouth and your nose, you have mucus, and these are all mu in your eyes as well too. This mucus helps protect uh, protect those areas. Chlorine gas will actually strip that mucus area away from the lungs, and then what happens is your lungs fill up with fluids, and so you essentially you're drowning in your own fluids. It's just a like I said, a horrible horrible way. The Germans. Um, well, so we'll talk about that, but the Germans were the first ones to use this, and this is a 1950 against the French army. Um, the French soldiers, they reported seeing this yellow-green clouds that were moving towards them. At first, they thought it was just the Germans firing off a, like a smoke screen at them, and then when the gas finally arrived, the French soldiers began to complain about pains in the chest and burning sensations in their throat, and of course, many of them ran away. They didn't know what was going on, and so they, got, they freaked out, and they, they got scared, and they ran away. About an hour after that attack, there was a four-mile gap in that line. So the soldiers just ran away. Now, this would have been a perfect time for the Germans to then advance and, and to run forward, but the Germans were a little scared because they didn't know what the, the gas would do to them, so they, they hesitated. And because they hesitated, um, then we had the, the rest of the Allied troops came in and they filled in that gap, so the Germans weren't able to take advantage of that situation. Mustard gas. This would actually melt the skin and the mucous membranes um, from the person that got hit with the mustard gas. Uh, when a person would breathe in the gas, it would attack the mouth, the lungs, the airways. It was a very slow, slow, slow death. What made mustard gas uh, so terrible as well, too, is the residual, the residue, it would settle on the ground. And then if you remember from those pictures earlier before, the no man's land would have all those potholes. Well, those potholes would fill up with water when it rained, and the mustard gas would settle on top of those little small little pools of water and so if a soldier ran through that or if they jumped in there to try to, to get cover uh, from gunfire they would now be uh, contaminated with this mustard gas. It didn't affect you immediately uh, within about 6 to 24 hours of exposure that's when you start feeling it and what it results in is a very very serious serious chemical burn. And, uh, and it, it takes a long time to heal uh, from these chemical burns. The use of, of these chemical weapons and these in this gas in World War I really was significant because within a few years after the war was over, there's what was called the Geneva Protocol. And if you've never heard of the Geneva Protocol before, what it really is is it's a rule book for when you fight a war. It's not anything goes. You can't do whatever you want to do in the middle of war. You have to follow some basic rules, and this is how you treat enemies. This is how you treat enemies. If you capture them, this is the kind of weapons you can use. The Geneva Protocol really was kind of the, the rule book for, for future wars, and they banned the use of gas during war, but it didn't ban nations from stockpiling it. 
And, and even today, we still have, in the Soviet Union, and, and many other countries still have chemical weapons and gas weapons that could be used against human beings. It, it's a terrible, terrible weapon, uh, but, but uh, they're still around. And hopefully, hopefully, they never get used again.